wasn't the correct word. I am old, though. <laughs> I'm officially old now. Educational um, purposes. So let me just uh, let me just say um, um, it might be good to just have you have you guys uh, put yourselves on mute so that uh, you know when we get bigger groups like this, uh, you know a, a a clutter of background noise can actually turn into a tidal wave. So um, I want to first of all introduce uh, uh, Christian Morabitu, who is here from uh, Buenos Aires, and um, as you know, I've I've told all of you about Christian, and some of you have met Christian already. Christian has been um, adding uh, Spanish subtitles to all of the Tuba People TV um, episodes. And he's done over 70 now in just over a year, which is amazing. So Christian was going to be here for Nortec and was going to be here for IHS. IHS may still happen, we don't know. But um, at some point, Christian is going to be here in person. And uh, we're going to do some, some good stuff. But later in this term, he's going to be uh, given a, a studio class for us on uh, just this whole process of subtitling Mr. Jacobs. Um, so, and, but today's uh, main, main headliner guest is, is uh, Frank Byrne. And uh, Frank uh, is, uh, uh, had a, enjoyed a, a career in the United States Marine Corps uh, where he was a librarian and a, a other administrative uh, person with the uh, Marine Corps band, the President's Own, and would uh, from time to time uh, sub in the tuba section wasn't an official member of the Tuba section, but, but would play from time to time. And then uh, retired from the Marine Corps and got into arts admin, which seemed like a natural fit. And uh, eventually ended up as executive director of the Kansas City Symphony. And uh, recently retired from the Kansas City Symphony and uh, as the executive director and uh, left it in uh, amazingly great condition. It's one of the strongest and most viable arts organizations in the United States. And this is uh, due in large part to, to Frank's vision. Frank also, as I mentioned, um, made, uh, is, is responsible for the two, the, the two uh, CDs uh, in this series, what I, call, what I lovingly call to uh, refer to as Jake in a Box. Um, uh, there's two of these. I think this is the second one. And um, uh, it's uh, really a, a, did, I think, a really great service for Mr. Jacobs, um, wherein uh, he's, uh, Frank put in uh, many of Mr. Jacobs' teaching philosophies and then also recorded examples of his playing, both solo, like from his basement tapes, and then from Chicago Symphony Orchestra and other, uh, other performing ensembles. And uh, one of the things that uh, was so uh, really great when the first one came out for me was because uh, Jacobs would talk about recording yourself and he would talk about recording himself in his basement and m my colleagues and I at Northwestern, we would be saying, well, I wonder what Jake sounds like in his basement. You know, what does he really sound like in his basement, you know? And so, so uh, um, through Frank's work, um, which he'll describe to you and other things, um, uh, we got to hear what Mr. Jacob sounded like in his basement and uh, really reinforced uh, to me what he had been telling us in our lessons. Uh, Mr. Jake, uh, 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 Frank studied with Mr. Jacobs and uh, was able to uh, uh, gain access uh, to, uh, to those basement tapes. So with that, Frank, Welcome to uh, to studio class here at the University of Oregon. Thank you. It's a it's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, I, in the interest of time, I won't ask each of you to introduce yourself, but uh, I uh, am, I'm delighted to be here. Um, you should know that I am an enormous fan of Professor Gross. Uh, I believe in what he is doing and has done and really think that you are blessed to have an exceptional teacher uh, and human being uh, in, in his role at your school. Um, I hope you appreciate that because I will tell you that uh, I appreciate him greatly. And I really think that he has done a remarkable service to the legacy of Arnold Jacobs. I met Mr. Jacobs in uh, 1974. Uh, the Chicago Symphony used to come to the Kennedy Center once a year in, in, uh, in Washington and play a concert. And I was able to get a ticket at the very front row uh, at intermission. I asked one of the musicians to go get him. He came out, I met him and told him I wanted to study with him. And after running the gauntlet that all of you have heard about, I had the uh, privilege of starting to study with him. Um, and maintained a relationship with him up until uh, he passed away. Um, you know, I was able 
to bring him to Washington to spend a week with us at the Marine Band doing master classes with each instrument of the uh, of the band. And uh, that was really something that he had not done before, working with a group of professionals in that way and, and for a week at a time. So it was very, very special. But um, I am like one of those people of which there are legion at this point uh, who could say that Arnold Jacobs changed my life. And in, in commenting that way, I don't mean to say that I was his best student or his favorite student or anything of that nature. But I will tell you that he had a profound impact on me. And when he passed away, uh, I was just highly motivated that his um, incredible teaching philosophies not fade away, not be lost. And another thing that I was resolute about is that to the extent possible, we should try to let Mr. Jacob speak for himself. Uh, very much in the, in the spirit of what Professor Gross is now doing with these Arnold Jacobs in his own words, videos that you've seen. But knowing that there were some uh, sources that could be mined for content, um, Sam Palafian, who at the time was working with Summit Records, um, and I were talking and he said, well, you should do this because he knew that I was good at taking on projects and a very, very long story short. And, <laughs> and it was a long story because uh, it was uh, kind of an operatic uh, journey to uh, get through this uh, process of putting the first CD together because I felt this enormous, enormous sense of responsibility uh, to Mr. Jacob's legacy to represent it in a way that I thought he would approve of. And to also capture some of his most essential teaching. And important about this is that we did not know that there would be a second CD at all. Uh, originally, we talked about making a two CD set. And then uh, we decided to get do one and see how that went. And of course, then the second one came along. But in the first one, um, it was uh, it was a very difficult process to locate all the sources and to get all the permissions that were necessary from all the requisite parties because I had to get signed letters of agreement from every Chicago Symphony Brass player that played on any of the recordings that were included. Uh, and I also had to get permissions from for the uh, orchestral excerpts that were taken from commercial recordings from the various recording companies. If you are really interested in the uh, Odyssean saga of putting this together, I wrote an article in what was then the TUBA Journal in 2001. And uh, I have that in a PDF that I can send to uh, Mike and he can share it with any of you who would like to read it. Uh, Jerry Young asked me to write it. Um, and explain how it came about, and I was happy to do that. But uh, if you'd like to read it, I will provide the article. Uh, it's, it, uh, we don't have to take time now going through uh, every uh, rabbit trail that, that I had to follow down. But I will say that it was a way to say thank you to Mr. Jacobs for all that he meant to me, and of course to hundreds of other people in a personal way, what he meant to me, um, because I felt that I owed him so much. Uh, he certainly taught me a great deal about playing the tuba, but I think he also taught me things about life and about how to be a good person, because he really was an extraordinary human being. And I, I, you know, I think what I was really unprepared for when I went to see him the first time was how approachable he was, how friendly, how kind and understanding he was. Uh, he, he was really remarkable. And, uh, you know, there are remarkable players that because of their huge status as musicians can be a jerk. And he was anything but that. He was a gentleman. He was just the warmest, and most understanding person 
and he and he truly knew how to bring out the best in people. You know, I remember at one lesson, he could tell that I was nervous and he put his hand on my knee and he said, relax, you're among friends. And, you know, I, I don't know what else he could have said that could have been more meaningful at that moment. But, you know, it was hard not to be intimidated by uh, the reputation of someone that I had idolized from afar because I had really never heard of Arnold Jacobs until when I was in high school in Hawaii. I happened to open a copy of the Instrumentalist magazine and see that Bill Bell had died. And it had kind of been a dream of mine to study with Bill Bell. And I was just crestfallen because I thought, oh my gosh, now I can't study with Bill Bell. And my high school band director, who was a remarkable person himself, took me into his office and opened up Farkas's Art of Brass Playing and pointed to a picture of Arnold Jacobs and said, this is the person that you should be thinking about. And of course, there he was in his uh, Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> you all have seen that picture. Uh, and I, you know, thought, okay, well, here I am in Hawaii. At that point, I never knew that I would, I had no idea I would end up in the Marine Band. Um, and have the privilege of studying with Mr. Jake. But anyway, um, I did, and I never forgot um, what that meant, you know, uh, to know that, got to know him well, have him, you know, to our house for dinner and to uh, just really get to, uh, to get some sense of the human being that he was. And uh, there's no doubt that I was a super fan. Uh, but, you know, making those CDs was a labor of love. And I, I hope you have them, both of them. I hope you listen to them with some regularity. And I say that, and I want to be quite clear, I, I've not been paid a dime uh, or made one penny from the work on those CDs and, and don't to this day. So by encouraging you to purchase them, I'm, there's nothing in it for me financially. Um, I just want uh, the essence of Arnold Jacobs, not interpreted through anyone else's lens, but through his own words, to, to carry this message forward. And I really believe that there are some profound truths about music and about brass playing in those CDs. And, uh, you know, I, if I have one regret, it is that I wish that I had access to every single take that I found in his basement. Um, you know, uh, Gazella was still alive when I visited the house uh, at that one point in Dallas. His son allowed me to take some stuff, but I didn't want to just clear the place out. I thought that would be disrespectful. Um, but I was just really grateful for what I got, what I ended up with, because I will tell you that the majority of those tape reels were unlabeled. And um, there were a lot of the tapes that he did use for practice were reused. So it was, it was the luck of the draw. But in spite of all that, you know, uh, it, it worked out and, uh, and we got those. And anything that's good on there has to be attributed to Mr. Uh, it's him and it's his teaching and, and the power of that. So I really do believe in, in what he did. And, and I'm just so grateful because I felt that he did a better job explaining that than I did. I could have. Um, but building on, on that experience and just in general, there's a, there's a few things that I'd like to share with you today that I think uh, carry on and reinforce some of the things that Arnold Jacobs believed in. And taking a, a cue from my experience with him, um, I want to start here. I think that as performers and as artists in training, one of the most critical things that you can determine for yourself is what your standards are and how you measure your progress. Uh, when I went to Arnold Jacobs, I will tell you that, and I was a good tuba player, not a great one, but a good one. I got a lot better. I thought, okay, I'm pretty good. He's probably 
twice as good as I am, three times as good as I am. It wasn't until I spent more time with him that I came to understand he was a hundred times better. He had standards I didn't know existed. And as a result of that, I was in no position to, to evaluate. Now, I still played the way I played. So you could measure me wherever you want on the scale, but I'm only saying that his level of artistry and skill and knowledge was beyond anything that I comprehended. So look at this little ruler that I have here. It's a little plastic six inch, six inch ruler, and I use it for various things and have kept it in my briefcase. And it's perfectly useful for what it is. But let's say for a moment, that because of the way you grew up and the way you were taught, someone taught you from your earliest age that this was a yardstick. Not a six inch ruler, but taught you that this was a yardstick. And through no fault of your own, you took that information and you measured everything in your life by this, thinking that this was a yardstick instead of a six inch ruler. That is a little illustration to just say there is no, absolutely no substitute for making sure that you have the right models and the right examples in your life and in your ear. And if anybody in this business ever tells you, come to my seminar because I'm going to give you the four shortcuts that will help you become a great player. Let me just stop right here and tell you from the bottom of my heart, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts, no matter who you are. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a little bit later, but there are no shortcuts. Every great artist that I have ever met sacrificed put in the work, continues to put in the work, and recognizes what an incredibly hard uh, life it is to be a professional musician. You know, the great pianist Vladimir Horowitz said that if I don't practice one day, I know. If I don't practice two days, my wife knows. And if I don't practice three days, everybody knows. You understand that. You understand that there is no slack in this system. And particularly if one wants to play at the highest possible level. So identifying the right standard is critically important. And the other thing that's critically important, I believe, is your ability as individuals to train your ear and to train your mind to discriminate between what is good and what is superb. Now, at a certain point in life, sometimes for some of us, the best player we've ever heard is the person who was first chair in the Allstate band or something like that. Um, or the best player in our town or in our particular region, and we, we calibrate it off of that. So when we think about this difference of what is the difference between good and superb, what is it that makes it different? That is what each of us have to begin to identify and to actually stay in touch with because I know many professional musicians who play very well, who are some of the world's finest soloists on their instrument, who will periodically go and play for other very, very trusted colleagues in a private setting to get a tune-up about what they're doing. And we're talking about major international soloists. And this is important because, as I'm sure you've learned from Professor Gross, imitation is a key tool in your ability to develop as an artist. And so we need to learn to listen. And to listen, even if the recording that we're listening to doesn't have absolutely perfect sound. We need to remember that listening once or twice won't do it. Sometimes we may need to listen 10 times, 20 times, whatever it is. And then there is the skill of active versus passive listening. You know, Passive listening is, it's music, it's in the background. Active listening is concentrating on this, stopping it, rewinding it, playing it again, listening to the details of it, 
And then making notes to yourself, which I would highly encourage, making notes to yourself about what is significant about that particular recording. One of the things that I will send to Professor Gross when we're done today is a two-page PDF with a selection of recordings that I would recommend that you listen to. They're all on YouTube. They'll be easy to find, but it will help expand the, the, the toolbox that you have to help on the imitation side of learning to make that distinction between good and superb. And then once you've identified excellence, then you need to find out how to reinforce that excellence in your own playing on a daily basis. As you've heard through some things that Mr. Jacobs said, he figured this out when he was at the Curtis Institute. And the key thing was to always focus on excellence. Play it slowly. Play it down an octave if it's too high. Play it up an octave if it's, if it's too low. Do whatever you need to do so that every note that comes out of your instrument is superb and has a really fine sound. You know, there are people that listen, quote unquote, and aren't really listening or they are practicing in a way that does not involve concentration. And I, I am not a believer in rote practicing because this is not like going to the gym and pumping iron. You know, it's not like that. You know, I don't know if you know people and I pray that you don't do this yourself, but I've known people, brass players that have practiced in front of the TV. Good God, what is going on? How can you practice in front of the television? Watch the television and practice it's just inconceivable because as mr jacobs would say what playing is about is about building conditioned responses to certain stimuli so what you do is you learn and you develop skill and you develop these conditioned responses based on what you imagine and what you want to achieve musically but those happen not by accident they happen by repetition and what you repeat builds patterns in your mind that will be very hard to undo if you develop a pattern of not focusing, not concentrating during your playing. So trust me when I say this is not like pumping iron at the gym or doing something like that. Uh, this is not about building muscle. You will develop some muscle tone through musical exercises. And Mr. Jacobs was a genius you know, at that. He knew how to provide musical stimulation to, provide, to achieve the other things that he wanted. It was always with a musical uh, goal. And, you know, the other part is that, you know, Bud Herseth, who was uh, Mr. Jacobs' uh, partner in crime in the brass section in Chicago, used to always say, never practice, always perform. And I think that that's a hard thing for us um, as tuba players, when we play mainly an accompaniment instrument to get into this idea of actually performing. And uh, that, that is something that we'll talk about a little bit later on. The other thing about practice, and this is not just about practicing the tuba, but it does go into a lot of things in life. But one of the biggest problems people have in business or in playing a, an instrument the big problem is not, is not incompetent. The big problem is inconsistent. So the question I wanna ask you is what is it that you're reinforcing daily? And how disciplined is your practice in terms of what you think about the first notes that you play? Are they music or are they some noise that is intended to you know, create function in your lip? So when you think about discipline practice, I think you have to come back to the point I said earlier that there are no shortcuts. I remember one time that the great violinist Pinka Zuckerman was in Kansas City playing with us and I had the opportunity to be with him backstage. And I'll tell you, standing next to him, as he just stands backstage and plays Long, basically like long tones on that beautiful Guarneri violin. That sound is just up close, is just unbelievable. 
And he told me that he plays one hour of slow scales every single day of the week. And this is someone who's at the very top of his ability. And I even heard something else in the uh, news coverage around when Kobe Bryant tragically passed away through that accident. In one interview, Kobe Bryant said that when I'm healthy, I make 1,000 shots a day. I, I don't have to tell you about his reputation as an athlete. This is someone who at the top of his game made 1,000 shots a day. So if people at that level do that, what does that tell us about what it is that we ought to be doing in terms of practice? Um, one of the things that I have included on this list that you'll get is a short video from Itzhak Perlman talking about practicing. And he said, things learned slowly are forgotten slowly. Now, it may seem tedious, but I have to tell you, you can get yourself in a mental space where you will become very comfortable and very enamored of slow play. Bud Herseth once told one of his students that he practiced slower than anybody he'd ever heard of. Now, I don't wish I knew what that sounded like. I wish I had tapes of him, but we don't. But this idea that someone at the very top of their game relishes and embraces slow practices. And I can tell you that in my lessons with Mr. Jacobs, he did a number of things where he would set a tempo either by snapping his fingers or by patting his leg uh, with basically like the metronome set on 60 for some of those exercises, uh, those first exercises uh, that you'll find in the back of that Hal Leonard book that I'm sure Mr. Gross knows all about. And you too, I hope. But that one exercise that I hear people on YouTube playing way too fast drives me nuts. That one exercise. Great beats and then come down. You know, there's somebody on YouTube who has said he's going to record Arnold Jacobs exercises. My God. Don't listen to him. That's all I can say. So as tuba players, the other thing I think that's critical is that we learn to, we have a, a diet of practice that includes an abundance of melody. Because you know, in an accompaniment instrument, we don't often get to play a lot of melodies or a lot of great melodies. I'm talking about melodies that have been written, operatic arias, other things. I'm a big fan of them. Um, so I recommend that you consider the study of certain operatic arias that can be adapted uh, for the tuba. And you know, one of the ways that I enjoyed practicing that is you can find books that not only have the vocal part, but they have a recorded accompaniment. And I actually shared uh, some of these things that I had in the, in the past with Professor Gross, and maybe he could even share them with you. But the idea to have a recorded accompaniment either piano or in some cases orchestra, to sort of get you in the mood and get your mind in the, in the idea of actually performing this as opposed to just playing a whole series of notes, I think is a very powerful thing. And so on the list of recordings that I'm sending you, and just a couple of examples are some very fine uh, basso and bass baritone um, arias that I think have a kind of musicianship, a kind of, in some cases, agility in, the, in some of the faster ones, um, and a, a fluency that we don't often hear on the tuba. And I would tell you, I think it's worth its weight in gold to, as, as a musician, to learn to interpret this music in a way that a great singer would. Um, Mr. Jacobs talked about that he used to practice the soprano aria, Un Bel Di, from Madame Butterfly on the tuba, and in addition to many other things just because he liked the music. I think high quality music gives you much greater opportunity for interpretation and for bonding with this music than 
you know, some generic thing that's been just written by someone that no one will ever remember. Another key thing about practicing and performing is to understand, and, and this is something that Mr. Jacobs knew so well, and in his genius, he went out of his way to not burden students with information, but to simplify things in a way that people would not be just drowning in content, but would be able to appropriate what he needed them to do. And one thing you have to understand is that we cannot fight nature. We can't fight nature. We have to learn to work with nature and work with the way our bodies and our minds are constructed in order to get better at our end. And fact is, as human beings, we are wired and, and programmed to identify what's wrong. It's sort of the fight or flight response. Ooh, something doesn't feel good. Something must be wrong. So that's the danger of playing by feel, which so many people do, either consciously or unconsciously, and letting that define how they are going to perform. I just think we have to recognize and accept that it is our nature to identify what's wrong. And we have to retrain ourselves in a way that we begin to identify what's right to reinforce that and not allow ourselves to have a two-way conversation asking questions while we should be issuing statements and learn to cooperate with them. And to reinforce what it is that you are doing right and well, even if it's three notes. Practice those three notes in the best possible sound in, in multiple registers. If you find that you're getting frustrated and can't achieve what you want, stop for a few minutes. There's no point in, in you know, bullying your way through this like a bull in a china shop. Stop, take a breath, think about what it is you want to do, refresh that mental image, and come back to the instrument with hopefully a better point of view. But you can't fight nature we may as well learn to work with it. Another thing I want to say is that I think that as I've gotten older, I've come to understand that there are some things about becoming an artist, that there are natural tensions in achieving these things. It's a very, very steep slope to get up to the highest level on an instrument. And how we do that, a lot depends upon our understanding and acceptance about what it is that we're trying to do. And there's two poles, as I see it, in the philosophy of playing an instrument. One is, on one hand, that everything is easy. And there's something to be said for that. And the other is that everything is hard. And there's also something to be said for that. Because if you really have a mature understanding of it, both things are true in a different context. On one hand, to say everything is easy, well, Mr. Jacobs would want you to understand that playing the tuba should not be something that wears you out. It should be something that brings you joy. And I remember one time talking with him in a lesson and I mentioned something about Beadlow and he said, oh, it's easy. Now for him, <laughs> for him, of course it was. And uh, for, for many of us, it's not. But his point in, in doing that is that done correctly and with the right motivation and of course the requisite practice, things are not necessarily the boogeyman that we might make them out to be. So he said at one point that if you can get out of your own way and focus on the music, it becomes easy and it becomes a joy to play. Well, I think that that's really what all of us want, isn't it? Because 
who wants to feel like you're going to a really bad job uh, or a, jo a distasteful job when you pick up your instrument? Oh my gosh, I got to do this again. Like it's something I've got to do as opposed to it's something that will bring me joy. And of course, other people's joy as well. The other poll is that everything is hard. And what I want to say about that is, I think that the more one advances on an instrument, the more profoundly you understand that nothing that is truly excellent comes easy. Now, I don't know how many of you know the name Doc Severance. Uh, he's been gone from uh, television for many years. He was for many decades the uh, band leader on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And Doc is still alive. I've met him a few times and he's an amazing guy. But one time on The Tonight Show, he was sitting there next to Johnny Carson with his trumpet and Johnny Carson asked him very sincerely, what's the hardest thing to do on the trumpet? And Doc picked up the trumpet and played a beautiful B flat whole note. He said, getting a great sound on the instrument is the hardest thing to do. Now that's not an answer many people would have expected. People would say, well, it's the triple time variation in the Carnival of Venice or whatever it might be. No, it is that understanding. And, it, and it, I think it's very profound. And, and I would say that embracing that tension should be empowering to us. Because if we want to succeed as performers, we're going to have to find a place of strength between those two poles and understand that it's okay that it's hard. Nothing worth anything of substance is easy. But if you can begin to understand that in the context that I'm, that I'm uh, suggesting it, I think it will give you, a, to an extent, comfort. That it's OK if you don't achieve everything in one day or one week or one semester or even one year. It's OK. It should take time. Give yourself the credit and mark these milestones in your own life about what you have achieved. And again, coming back to the standards, what are you measuring by? This or the right standard? The last two little things I'll say before I allow you to ask any questions you'd like is that if I could make one suggestion, and I'm sure it's not a new suggestion to you, I'm sure Professor Gross, preaches this to you all the time, but let me, let me add an amen from the uh, cheap seats here. If I could give you one piece of advice about how to become a better tuba player, I would say religiously, sincerely, enthusiastically play on the mouthpiece. It transformed me. And when I first went to my first lesson with Mr. Jacobs, he said, I want you to work up to playing on the mouthpiece 30 minutes a day, and I want you to play loud on the mouthpiece. Now, please understand that if you've not done it a lot, it, uh, it can be tiring. But I'll tell you, I got to the point where I just loved doing it, and I'm sure I was doing it well over an hour, a day, you know, spread out, of course, the whole day in different ways. But it, it became, for me, just the single most beneficial thing that I could do to improve my playing, improve my sound, my accuracy, and to get my ear truly understanding what it was I was sending into the instrument as opposed to what I thought I was sending. And at the time, which has been many years ago, of course, I used to enjoy playing along with the radio. Now, these days, you might want to find a streaming service that you like. But the key thing I would say is to find material that you can play along with that has melodies, melodies that can be can be uh, played uh, competently on the mouthpiece. And, and Mr. Jacobs was a big one about playing songs that you know very well, whether it be Happy Birthday or something else, Old Lang Syne or anything else. But I tell you, I got to the point where I would. <laughs> play along with classical music stations and play along with, uh, you know, the whole New World Symphony, um, playing all the melodies and everything on the mouthpiece. 
used to do it in the car religiously. Um, I think playing on the mouthpiece is uh, a true secret weapon and that you can do enormous benefit to your playing by actually making music on the mouthpiece. And it, I will tell you, it's possible to get quite a good sound on the mouthpiece alone. And then when you put it in the horn, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So please don't, um, don't neglect that. I, I encourage you to really embrace it. The other thing I would say is that there are some simple things you can do to train your ear in the course of your practicing. And something that I used to do is to take a simple song like Old Lang Syne or something like that and by ear, play it in all 12 keys um, in the course of practice. It really helped me to just get in uh, my brain and, and in my, my ability to sort of think about music, think about intervals, um, to play these simple songs, trying to have a really good sound and to play them musically but to go through the circle of keys. And uh, I don't know, I found that very uh, beneficial. And I would encourage you to try it. It can actually be kind of a fun game to challenge yourself. So um, we are at about 345 or so. I'm going to shut up. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of you have about anything that I've said or anything that I've not said. So take it away. Just oh, by the way. Let me uh, let me show you my uh, my cup. Yeah, hey, all right. Any uh, anybody have a question? Just raise your hand and um, and just uh, unmute yourself there. Oh my gosh, Claire's in two places at once. What's going on? Oh, now she's back to more. So hey, before we before I forget, let me take our I'm going to take our uh, our group screenshot picture. Okay. Absolutely, I want. Okay, okay, here we go. All right, Manny, you never look better. <laughs> Manny. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. This is good. Anybody have a question uh, 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 for Mr. Byrne? Good question. While you're thinking of your question, let me just um, ask. Oh, Claire, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, I had two. The first one was. Go for it. They're they're free. Can you guys like hear me all right now? So I'm on the different. The different uh, computer. You can kind of hear me. I can hear you. Okay, wait. Yeah. Um. Okay. So when you know, with setting the um, setting your standard as like you know Arnold Dickens or something, it's like you know I want to get one note right, and you start there. How do you? I guess how do you like balance? You know, not getting stuck with only playing one note for a week. You know with trying to get that, you know, measure yourself to that standard. So how, how do you balance that with like the rest of your routine, you know, where it's like, if you can't get one note right, you're like, well, I don't want to play the whole etude. I want to get the one note. Do you know what, do you know what I'm saying? It's a good question. And I, I appreciate you asking. Um, it is one of those things that I think we have to accept that Excellence cannot be created from silence. You have to make sound in order for it to be improved. And Mr. Jacobs, I think, would endorse that wholeheartedly. So I think it's very critical for not to, to not overthink this to the point where perfection on a single note becomes uh, paralyzing to, to an individual. In other words, maybe you could say that you want to have, if you're, if you're working on an A2, the objective, of course, is to be able to play through the entire thing. But maybe you would work on it in section so that you would practice you know, the first part and then the second half or whatever it might be. But absolutely, the, the idea is if it's the sum of the parts at the end of the day that matters. So I would suggest that in terms of a routine, as I said, Focusing on excellence, maybe your answer is that it would be slowed down or certain things would be shifted octaves, but that the idea that you would do it in totality um, 
at the best level that you possibly could. Now that doesn't represent the best that you will ever do it, but I think one can make progress, but there is no progress from silence. So we have to be prepared to make mistakes, to not always sound the way we want, but it's a matter of a process of matching that ideal that we have in our head. I will tell you for me personally, the biggest detriment to sounding better for me was sometimes an inadequate message in the head. If you think about the, the picture that you have, the musical picture you have in your brain is motivating function. You know, for most of us, it's like a 20 watt light bulb. With Mr. Jacobs, it was like a laser beam. You know, he he had miraculous solfege skills and uh, could hear every note perfectly in tune, and he had great talent as well. So I want to encourage you, while having uh, this highest possible standard in mind, to not become paralyzed by that, but to become empowered by it. And I think that it's possible to do these things simultaneously. And I think at the end of the day, you you and others can gain confidence by just uh, trying to ha have those things that matter, sound, intonation, and then also interpretation done at the best possible level. But by all means, keep playing. You had two questions. You have another? Okay. Yes, well, yes, sir. I, I couldn't remember it, so it might come back to me. Okay, okay. Who's no, next? No way. Yes, sir. Um, it's not necessarily a question, um, but just kind of um, a comment about your statement about buzzing. Um, mm -hmm. I think most of the time, at least for me, I definitely have realized not um, that I forget to buzz enough on the mouthpiece. Um, like I just see buzzing as like a warm up, you know, before I start playing, pick up the mouthpiece, start buzzing for I'm not the most five minutes and then take it back to the tuba. Um, but I think what you said that you, you Dr. Jacobs, I mean, Arnold Jacobs, so 30 minutes daily, I think I can, I think that probably can be very useful to just even get your sound to be better, you know, increase your range, just your musicality, because I just saw it as a very much as a warm up type of exercise. And I feel like if I transfer it in my tuba, like the same way I use my tuba, then it can definitely do me a lot better. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you. I, I, I really believe that. And uh, as Professor Gross may preach, uh, you know, I would say we think about playing on the mouthpiece as opposed to buzzing on the mouthpiece that even though that's what you're doing, that we're actually playing music on the mouthpiece so that it's not done as a physical act to warm up the tissue, that happens, but that the very first sound you make, whether it's on the mouthpiece or on the horn, should be a good sound. And this idea of playing melodies on the mouthpiece gives one a way to do it. And the reason he recommended melodies is it, simple songs, like I said, whatever it is, happy birthday, uh, my country tis of thee, you name it, very simple songs is that you have a very strong mental image of what the pitches are. And I think the first time people do this, if they've not done it before, sometimes they find that they're not buzzing the right pitches. Or if you're working mm -hmm. on a piece of music and you take the horn, the mouthpiece out of the horn and you try to buzz, you know, a line where you're having trouble, you find out that in fact what you're sending in is not quite accurate. So I think that there's a huge mm -hmm. amount of benefit to it. And it, it, it will, by the nature of it, build strength. It will also greatly increase your airflow um, mm. and, and help you to have, it, it will make playing much easier because it, it, is somewhat, uh, it is somewhat strenuous. And if you have a, uh, a burp or other device where you can also finger the horn, that stimulus of fingering the horn when you're trying to do this is sometimes beneficial to people. Uh, when they're trying to work something out. So I would encourage you to think about those things that reinforce more than one thing at a time. But uh, I would say, whatever you do, always do it with a strong, very powerful musical. Okay, thank you. Great, anybody, anybody else have a question? Again, Christian, it's so nice to see you down in Buenos Aires. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. I have a question. Oh, yes, sir. 
Oh, nice to meet you, sir. First of all, forgive my English is not so good, but I'm, I'm It's doing much my better best. than my Spanish, so. <laughs> I heard that before. So I just, uh, just talking about that, I, I want to ask you if you, first of all, uh, use your singing, uh, uh, you know, instrument, you know, your, your voice, singing all the time to get the, the right picture in your mind first and to put your mouthpiece in your lips? Well, unfortunately, uh, I am a terrible singer. Uh, I wish I could <laughs> sing like Mr. Jacobs. You know, Mr. Jacobs was a wonderful singer. And uh, to have yeah, him no. sing something in a lesson was just, you know, illuminating. But I am actually a terrible singer. But I, I love singing. And truthfully, if I could wave a magic wand, and if I could do anything, At, a, at the highest level, it would be to be a great singer. Uh, but it's not my gift. And uh, so it, that does not help me for me to do it myself that much. On the mouthpiece, yes, absolutely, that was very helpful. But to vocalize, um, I didn't find that helpful. But if one can sing, I can imagine that that could be, that could be a, a nice uh, component to practice it. But the key thing is to have uh, a picture in your in your mind of what a truly great singer uh, is, and there are some wonderful examples. I mean, honestly, you folks have exponentially more uh, examples available to you than than Professor Gross and I did back when we were your age. I mean, we used to have to, you know, go to record stores and find things and order them and blah 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 blah. Now there's so much stuff available on YouTube. And uh, I, as I said, I'm providing a two page list of things that I encourage you to listen to. And look, I, I am a realist. You don't know me. Um, I am not painting myself as uh, some great world famous expert, but I am telling you that I think I know a few things. And I'm going to send you this list through Professor Gross of uh, some recordings that I hope you will listen to. And I'm not naive. I, I know that some of you won't. Some of you will listen to one and not to the rest. I will. I will. Good. Thank you, Christian. Sure, But I will say this. I will send this list. And I really hope that you will listen to this stuff and think about it. Think about it. And Uh, Professor Gross has my email, but if any of you want to write to me afterwards and tell me what you learned from listening to these recordings and what some of your observations are, whoever writes the first, the, the, whoever writes the best, whoever writes the best email about what they learn, I will send a gift, okay? Oh. And so uh, that's a little cool. competition for you. <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, my pleasure. I don't know if uh, any of you uh, have to get to a synchronous class at two o'clock our time. Uh, so if you need to leave the, the meeting, feel free to. Um, it's no penalty or anything. I, uh, does anybody else have, anybody have another question for Frank? Because I have one or two, but I, I want to make sure you guys get your. Okay, so Frank, you know, just uh, can you describe that experience of going into Mr. Jacobs' basement after he had passed away and just going through all those, you know, just what was down there and he didn't teach down there anymore, so that was, it was not that situation like it had been, but what was that like? I mean, because, you know, so well, many stories about his basement. Yeah, well, this was not his basement on Normal Avenue, fortunately. Oh. Um, oh, yeah, this was at Maplewood. This yeah. was at Maplewood. This was at yeah. Maplewood. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I will tell you that, you know, he, he and Mrs. Jacobs moved to this house in, on Maplewood and away from the famous house on South Normal Avenue, which unfortunately I was never at. But uh, Mr. Jacobs' son, Dallas, told me that in the entire time they lived in that house, there was only one thing that went into that house and went out of it, and that was him. 
because that house I had, I believe, had previously belonged to Gazella's mother, yeah, Mrs. Balfi, yeah. and and they had moved into the house, and she lived with them as long as she was alive. But from everything I've heard, it was floor to ceiling uh, stuff, you know, stacks of newspapers and National Geographic magazine, and God knows what, um, and probably a terrible fire hazard. So I know that it took Dallas and his wife Dorothy uh, many months to clean that house out and get it to the point where it could be sold. So by comparison, the house on Maplewood was uh, really, um, you know, very tidy, I'm sure. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, I just, I just have to say that um, being in his home was a humbling experience. It was a rolling office chair in the kitchen that he used to sit in and roll around the kitchen, uh, you know, and sit there at the kitchen table. Just going down there and knowing that this was his stuff. It felt, even though I knew I was there with permission, and the other part is that Gazella was not well. She was in a hospital bed in the living room of that home. And, you know, just being in their house, you know, it's hard not to feel like an intruder, uh, even though I'm not, you know. Um, and I, I would just say it was a very humbling experience. And uh, I, I just wanted to do right by him. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And just the, the whole process of uh, getting him to come to the United States Marine Corps band the president's own for a week. I mean, that was unprecedented. I, I'm not aware of any other class that he's given, you know, over a period of an entire week. It's always, uh, unless it maybe is at Northwestern, but it was, otherwise it was one or two or three days, maybe four, but hardly not. Well, it was a miracle. Uh, he did have to cancel once because he was not feeling well. And I was holding my breath <laughs> that they would get off the plane in Washington, you know, I, and, and then that it would go well, you know. Um, but I have to say that uh, he, he was a trooper. He put in full days, all five days that we did this. And um, we worked him hard. But we paid him a, a nice amount of money, uh, really not an extraordinary amount of money. But he was, he, was, he was very moved by the whole thing. And I think that uh, he found it to be very professionally satisfying. And, and I know that it was very inspiring for everyone who was there. But um, there'll just never be another one like it. Uh, there are plenty of fine teachers. And, uh, you know, through Tube of People TV, you have the privilege of seeing a lot of people that you would never meet otherwise. And um, you can hear people talk about the reverence that they have for Arnold Jacobs. And there's a reason for that. Um, we are not a bunch of starstruck uh, kids that, that are just in love with a myth. Um, he was a truly remarkable individual. And the other thing, and, and, I, and I wrote some of this in the notes for these CDs and in other articles. The other thing you have to understand is that he was held in the highest possible esteem by his colleagues. You know, it's not just us wannabes that, and that that are impressed by him. He was held in the highest respect and the highest possible esteem by his. And there's really something to be said for that. Because I can tell you that familiarity can breed contempt. Um, but to have someone who daily inspired his colleagues, you know, there's uh, that great story that is in one of uh, the interviews about the time they played, uh, I think it was Bruckner Six, and I think it was with Rafael Kubelik. And for some reason, in that occasion, they set the, the prince, brass principles in like a diamond shape where Dale Clevenger was in the front, and to the right behind him was Jay Friedman, and then Bud Herseth, and behind the two of them was uh, Mr. Jacob. And some students that had been there were talking to Mr. Herseth afterwards and said, wow, you all sounded incredible, but I can't believe Arnold Jacobs. And 
Harseth smiled and said, it's like he has his hand in the small of our back, just urging us along, you know, every, everywhere we go. And uh, I don't know. He, uh, he was remarkable. It was a remarkable moment in orchestral history that, uh, that we can all continue to learn. Thank you so much, Frank. I don't want to uh, impose upon your time too much longer. Last call for any, uh, any questions from anybody? You know, I would say the other thing, and I'm not pressuring anybody, is that is that a key skill in making progress is to overcome one's natural shyness. And, you know, it's like when I went up to the stage at the Kennedy Center and asked someone to go find Arnold Dick, you know, I mean, there's no points for staying in the seat. Whatever you do, whether it's in music or other things, just do it. You know, just try it. You know, I used to be for so many years intimidated. Oh, there's other people that are smarter or more talented or this or that or the other. But I quickly found out that, you know, other people aren't necessarily as remarkable as you might imagine they are. And if you just get out there and do it, you will learn so much and you will find out things and you will discover things about music and about yourself that you didn't know were possible, but you have to take that step. So, you know, every time you have the opportunity to pick the brain of someone who might know something that you don't, please be brave and do it. And uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime, but I just want to thank you for your attention and your kindness to um, allow me to chat with you for an hour. Been, it's been wonderful to spend time with you. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Appreciate what you had to say today. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Frank. Mike, will you send me that screenshot, please? I, of course, will. You bet. Okay. Hey, and I will, I will send those documents to you. Oh, okay. okay. Very good. Yeah. Mr. Gross, can we get uh, Mr. Frank's uh, email? Yeah. Is that okay with thank you, Frank? You. Of course. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I'll send that to you. Thank you. Right, Thank you, everyone. Right. Have right. a great day. Bye bye. Thank bye. you, sir. Bye. 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 Mike. Bye, Mike. Bye. Bye. Bye.